wet and cold after, uh, evening here in October. Uh, my name is John Godfrey, and I'm the Assistant Dean for International Education at the Rackham School. I'm also Chair of the University's Wallenberg Committee. And on behalf of the Wallenberg Committee, it is my great honor to welcome you and to introduce you to this annual Wallenberg Lecture. Tonight, we honor two remarkable human beings. We honor and celebrate Bill Bash, who is with us to receive the Wallenberg Medal from the University of Michigan. And we honor and celebrate Raoul Wallenberg, the man for whom this medal and lecture are named. In the second half of 1944, the lives of these two individuals intersected in the nightmarish crossroads of Budapest. It was to Budapest that the Swedish diplomat Raoul Wallenberg came on a mission to disrupt as best he could the final chapter in the campaign of being waged against the Jews of Europe. And it was to Budapest that Bill Bash fled from a village in the Carpathian Mountains of Hungary, a young man who became a tough survivor and joined Wallenberg's skilled, daring, and determined band of accomplices. I would like to take a few minutes here to talk to you about the man whom this award and medal honor. Raoul Wallenberg was born into one of Sweden's great families and a world of wealth and privilege. His life's journey, however, was outward bound. From an early age, Raoul's interests lay beyond the comfortable circle of parlors and summer houses of Stockholm's elite and out in the wider world. His family was determined not to spoil him and fostered his lifelong commitment to energetic and purposeful activity. Raoul combined an unusual intellectual intensity and curiosity with an unflagging interest in other persons. He came of age possessed of a broad independence of spirit and a calm and resolute self-confidence. When he was 19, Wallenberg traveled to the very distant Ann Arbor to take up the study of architecture here at the University of Michigan. Why Michigan? Because, on the advice of his grandfather, he believed that a great public university in the heart of North America would open to him a wide diversity of people and their experiences. Wallenberg was a brilliant student who graduated from here with the highest standing in architecture. During his time in Ann Arbor, he also managed frequent road trips, hitchhiking during holidays all over the United States, Canada, and Mexico, which was quite an achievement in the late 1930s. It was at Michigan that Wallenberg deepened his insight into human needs and motivations and discovered his skills as a negotiator while crossing boundaries of language, social class, culture, and experience. It was here also that he evinced a cooler recognition that the openness he sought in the world had its harder and harsher limits. In a first year paper he wrote while he was here, he observed that the open-mindedness of humanity, even in our generation, is a myth. Maybe the individual is open-minded on one question, but on this question, he generally belongs to the minority. In most other things, he generally is extremely reactionary. Indeed, after graduating and some traveling in the world, Wallenberry returned to a Europe becoming increasingly dangerous and harsher. Partnered with a Hungarian Jew, Wallenberg made frequent business trips to Budapest, where, with his innate linguistic facility, he quickly learned Hungarian. By 1944, and with support of the American War Refugee Board, and provided with, and armored with, diplomatic status given to him by the Swedish government, Wallenberg accepted the task of trying to save the surviving Jews of Budapest. Wallenberg threw himself into this mission with characteristic determination, fearlessness, and ingenuity. He found about 400 Jewish volunteers, of which our evening's guest of honor was one, and accorded them Swedish diplomatic protection and told them to remove from their clothing the yellow stars that marked them for death. He designed an impressive but fict fictive protective pass, which his accomplices spirited through Nazi-occupied Budapest to distribute to Jews awaiting deportation. By force of persuasion, personality, 
intimidation, and cool-eyed fearlessness, Wallenberg created a network of willing and sometimes unwilling associates in his desperate scheme built on artifice and raw nerve. Using American funds, Wallenberg rented buildings to shelter thousands of Jews in properties that he declared to be under the extraterritorial authority and protection of the Swedish government. It is estimated that 20,000 persons owe their lives to Wallenberg's ingenuity and the audacity of his companions. In the last days of the war, Wallenberg confronted the Nazi commandant who was poised to launch a final massacre in the, Buddhist, in the Budapest ghetto, saving another 70,000 lives. And, but within days of the war's end, Soviet agents abducted Wallenberg and his journey through the world ended in mystery and darkness. Yet, in an important sense, the spirit of Raoul Wallenberg's journey continues. It brings us together here tonight to honor one of his brave companions at the dark crossroads on the Danube and to learn about another journey. Tonight is the 13th occasion for us to celebrate Raoul Wallenberg's inspiration. Previous recipients of the Wallenberg Medal remind us how moral courage finds expression in people with different backgrounds and with different commitments. Persons who have received this in the past years, this award in the past years, include Elie Wiesel, Jan Karski, Helen Suzman, the Dalai Lama, Per Anger, Marion Pritchard, Kazi Grotem, John Lewis, Nina Lagergren, Marcel Marceau, and last year, Kailash Satyarthi. From the stories of these remarkable individuals, we are reminded how difficult and perilous are the struggles for freedom, human dignity, and social justice, and how fragile is, in Wallenberg's world, words, the open-mindedness of humanity. We are fortunate this evening to have Paul Courant, the Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs of the University, to introduce our honored guest and to present the Wallenberg Medal. As he comes forward, on behalf of the Wallenberg Committee, I wish to thank Provost Courant for helping us acknowledge how this university has been inspired and uplifted by Raoul Wallenberg's spirit, courage, and deathless humanitarian commitment. Thank you, John. I'm honored to be here tonight and to have a role in conferring the Raoul Wallenberg Medal on Bill Bosch. I have these ceremonial roles frequently in my current line of work. Uh, and I must say, I'm humbled to be able to present an award in the name of Raoul Wallenberg. So this is a, this is a good moment. As, as Dr. Godfrey, as John mentioned, Raoul Wallenberg was a man of great courage who, has, who committed himself to the protection of others. He worked valiantly and effectively against the Nazis and their allies to help Jews escape persecution and death. The University of Michigan is proud of its connection to him and pleased to be able to honor his life and work with the presentation of the Wallenberg Medal. As you know, Wallenberg was an architecture student at Michigan, and there is a plaque in his honor in Lorch Hall, which at that time housed the architecture program and where I now have my faculty office as a professor of economics. It reminds me, the plaque, often of Wallenberg's great courage he was a hero of mine long before I knew of any of his connection to Michigan. To introduce Bill Bosch, the 2003 recipient of the medal, is also a great honor. The story of his life is one of hardship and persecution, but also one of bravery, understanding, and forgiveness. And it is the second set of qualities that make him such an appropriate recipient of the Wallenberg Medal. The inscription on the medal reads, one person can make a difference. Bill Bosch, through his work, printing and delivering passes, official looking documents that declared Jews were protected by the Swedish legation in Hungary, <coughs> saved many lives and made a very real difference. As a teenager living alone in Budapest, Mr. Bosch delivered these false papers to Jews who could use them for protection until they could be taken out of the country to safety. The delivery of such papers was very risky possession of them meant immediate execution. And yet this very young man persisted in delivering them. 
He learned the map of the city's sewer system so he could travel through its tunnels to make deliveries. He has written about how, in such constant danger, he moved beyond fear and learned to function despite the terrible circumstances in which he was living. To survive in such a time required quick thinking and resourcefulness. Mr. Bosch tells a frightening story about being caught by Hungarian soldiers when he had several false documents in his possession. Somehow he had the presence of mind to figure out how to escape. The soldiers had placed their guns against a wall so they could examine the documents he was carrying. As they did so, he kicked the guns to knock them over and took off running. It gave him a few seconds head start. The soldiers had to bend over and pick up their guns before they could start shooting at him. He was able to get far enough down the block to blend into a group of Jews that other soldiers had rounded up. He had escaped immediate death one more time. He had no way of knowing that the group in which he had hidden himself would be sent to a concentration camp. One of the most striking stories in Mr. Bosch's history tells of being marched through a village in Germany. Let me read briefly from what he says. This is a quotation. As we were marching through a small village, an elderly woman appeared on the second floor of a house. I can see her now. She held her apron up and stood against the window. We were starving and used to people throwing rocks or hot water at us, but when she dropped the apron, 20 loaves of bread just rolled onto the street right next to us. Of course, we rushed to get the bread. We did not see the SS soldier who aimed his machine gun and shot her. The woman gave her life for us. It's the end of the quotation. Mr. Bosch says that this is when he learned not to condemn the world not even the Germans, because individuals do step forward to act for others. Mr. Bosch ultimately was taken to the Dachau concentration camp, where in April 1945, he and 29,000 others were liberated by American troops. Since 1947, he has lived in the United States. Starting with nothing, he and his wife Rose, or Holly as she was called, built a rich and loving family life here. Many members of that family are here this evening. Sadly, Mrs. Bosch passed away as a result of an illness caused by experiments performed on her when she was a girl at Auschwitz. Their children, grandchildren, and cousins, many of whom are here this evening, bring joy and fulfillment to Mr. Bosch's life today. For many, that might be the end of the story. But Bill Bosch is an extraordinary man. He continues to act on the belief that motivated him when he was 16. One person can make a difference. He says that he wants to repay society for all it has given him. So he spends much of his time in schools, such as this one, speaking with children, and some older than children, about the Holocaust. He doesn't dwell on the atrocities, focusing instead on helping children understand why and how such an awful thing can happen. He hopes this younger generation will see that individuals can make a difference, and that each of us has a responsibility to act in the face of hatred and make our own contributions to a better world. It is a great honor to thank Mr. Bosch for what he has done for all of us through his courageous actions, and it is a special privilege to confer upon him the Raoul Wallenberg Medal. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks to Dean Gaffrey, Professor Koran, Lynn Dumas, Jill McDonough, Dana Russ Greenberg, and Penny Schreiber. I'm very grateful to each one of you for honoring me tonight, and I hope I can live up to your expectation.
The honor you do me tonight means more than I can say. Despite all sadness and tragedy of the events which bring me here tonight, I'm immensely gratified that you associate me with that great man, Raoul Wallenberg, who saved Kant's life because of his personal courage and conviction. I was born in 1927 in a village of 3,000 souls called Sassova. It was a poor village that liked both running water and power. This village still exists. It, what was Czechoslovakia is now in the Ukraine. Nearly all the villagers were small farmers. Among them were approximately 35 Jewish families. My family owned and ran a general store that my mother had inherited from her father who inherited from his father, and so on and so forth. The closest largest city to our village was 10 to 15 miles away. So our general store sold everything to the community needed from cradle to grave. It's good. They came to us for raw materials. We sold lumber, sold textile, groceries, even wine that we made from our own vineyard. Truly, the store had anything anyone would need in the course of life and death. My mother uh, kept a comfortable home with the help of two maids, one a nanny who helped with her two girls and three boys, and the other who helped in the store. As young children, we were very happy. We were, we were a well-off family in the community, and we didn't want for anything. Our father had perhaps one of the only shortwave radios in the village. During the late 1930s, he always had the latest updates on the progressing the war. The Hungarian government had forbidden anyone from listening to the news of the war on shortwave radio or any other foreign station that would reveal its horrors. My father and his dear friend, the local priest, would often retreat to the basement of our home to secretly listen to the news. During the war, my father always had three flags on hand, the Czech, the Hungarian, and German. He would always fly one over our home, depending on which side seemed to be winning the battles fought over our territory. On March 15, 1941, the Hungarians took over the area. Soon thereafter, a new law was enacted that allowed only 6% or 6 out of every 100 Jewish children to attend public school. As, as a Jewish child, I was forbidden to attend public school. I was forbidden to attend as a student. However, at this time, most of the people in my community were Ukrainian, didn't speak Hungarian. And because I spoke both Hungarian and Ukrainian, well, I was ironically alive to remain in school as a Hungarian love language tutor to the Ukrainian students. <laughs> Nevertheless, as Hungarian, as Hungarians, we continue to enjoy fairly good lives, but the Jews of Poland and Germany were suffering tremendously. We continue to believe that because Hungary held an alliance with Germany and Italy, the unbelievable rumors we heard about the fate of Jews elsewhere would not befall us in our small village. After all, we were Hungarian citizens. <laughs> Boy, were we wrong. On Passover in 1942, my father was reciting the blessing over the wine with us gathered around the table. Passover is a joyful giving of thanks to the Creator. But for the first time, I witnessed my father stumble over his words. His hands were shaking and tears filled his eyes. He told us that he had a premonition that this could be our last celebration together as a family and that soon our lives could drastically change. In 1944, the Nazis took over Hungary. 
Jews quickly passed shocking and outrageous law that prevented the Jews from living normally and instead were forced to endure deplorable conditions under gross atrocities. Soon after a small village everywhere, Jews were rounded up and deported to the Nazis, deported by the Nazis to Auschwitz to be exterminated. My father had a plan that he hoped would save at least some of the family from Hitler's reign of terror. Finding Jews in a small village was not a difficult task. My father reasoned that in a big city we could hide by fading into the worst population. He decided to send my brothers and myself to different cities in Hungary in the hope that we would have a better chance of surviving the war. My sisters were too young to leave and remained behind in our village with my mother and father. My father sent me to Budapest where I embarked upon a journey of survival and eventually led me to the work of Raoul Wallenberg. I arrived in Budapest as a young man of 16. I found food and shelter in the homes of Budapest Jews, for it was not uncommon to simply knock on a fellow Jew's door with a request for food and shelter and be granted that request. Homeless Jewish children in Budapest could rely on the long-established custom of asking seven or so families for help and would, would, and would be willing to feed them one day out of the week. This way, I knew where my meals would come from on any given day. I didn't have to beg for meal to meal. Now, where I slept was another story, or is another story. For work, I found a job as an apprentice to a cabinet maker. The work was tolerable, but I discovered early on that the Gentile Hungarian apprentices didn't want to work with a Jew. It became clear that my life was at grave risk the longer I was employed with a cabinet maker. Great peril was now befalling the Jews. For soon after I arrived in Budapest, the president of Hungary, Miklos Horthy, issued a decree to round up all the Jewish young people and put them into forced labor camps. In order to save myself from the new decree, I had to have employment, a Gentile address, and a Gentile identity. My savior came as a Christian tailor who offered me work and sanctuary in the shop. He was a good and well-respected man who allowed me to sleep on his cutting table after the day's work. The deal was simple. I gave him my free labor for a few hours of sleep every night. And during the day, I was to seek other work and food, as the tailor could not give me both. The tailor couldn't give me both room and board. For a while, I felt secure. The kind-hearted tailor who hid me was a dedicated church-going person, and he was aware that he couldn't be arrested for keeping a Jew on his premises. Suddenly, around this time, a name was soon spoken among my friends. This name belonged to a man who was helping the Jews by creating Swedish passports, official papers saying that they were Swedish citizens and were thereby safe from harassment from the Nazis and deportation to the camps. Jews who were lucky enough to obtain these official papers could even get out of Hungary and go to countries that were free from Nazi occupation. My friend and I were soon recruited by Zionist organization in Budapest that was dedicated to help Jews leave Hungary and go to any safe country that would accept them. One evening at a Zionist meeting, I was approached by a man who asked me if I would be willing to work with the underground. I was told that the underground was supporting Wallenberg's work of giving out official pass official Swedish papers referred to as Schutzpass, which would legally allow Jews to leave Hungary. I said yes, of course, for I was eager to help. I knew the work would be dangerous, but I wanted to be part of something important. 
I was now in a constant exposure of being discovered. But all of us were willing to risk our life to save other Jews. After the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto and the annihilation of Polish Jews, many desperate young Jewish people escaped to Budapest. They were very vulnerable. They were completely lost. They didn't speak the language, and they were in constant fear of being captured and deported and annihilated then. I was soon running to Wallenberg offices to collect shoot passes, and Wallenberg would occasionally greet me. He was a slim, tall gentleman with a dignified demeanor and a very strong, charismatic personality. Each time I met him, I was impressed by his gentleness and caring, but he was truly a good man who lived up to his Christian principles. He understood the gravity of what we were trying to accomplish, and the aspiration of those who of those trapped. When I visited his office, he personally gave me several different passports, they fully understanding they would be copied and distributed. These passports would soon save many, many lives. For Wallenberg's safety, we kept at a distance. We were very careful not to be seen with, with Wallenberg his assist, or his assistant. The Nazis should never be able to tie us to him and to shoot passes, thereby endangering him or his work. I would take the blank passports to the underground print shop located in an abandoned Jewish high school in Budapest. We had set up a copying system in one of the rooms. In the shop, there were 12 to 15 people operating machinery, cameras, printing presses. Here we copied the Swedish documents many times over. Once the shoes pass were printed, young boys like myself began to deliver the documents to Jews in hiding throughout Budapest and also in the Wallenberg safe houses. Wallenberg had bought or leased about 30 large apartment houses and succeeded in declaring them Swedish territory. He draped this building with Swedish flags with understanding that the Germans would respect their Swedish jurisdiction. He also fortified his safe houses with a far amount, fair amount of bribes to the SS and to Gestapo. Thousands of Jews were crowded into these buildings where they hoped they would be free from Nazi persecution. In reality, they were far from safe. For at times, soldiers would storm through the buildings in the dead of night. They rounded up the terrified residents at a gunpoint, deported them in mass to the, Nazis to the Nazi concentration camps. I became more and more involved in the production and delivery of the Schutzpanz. I always had the shoes pass strapped to my body underneath my clothing as I delivered them. I always had fake Gentile papers in case I was stopped and searched by soldiers. The new Hungarian leadership, the Aerocross, had recently had a successful coup against President Horthy. The Hungarian police were now completely cooperating with Nazis and eagerly rounding up and deporting Jews. They were aware of the underground and they searched for anyone they thought would be involved with them. I was forced to leave the safety and shelter of the tailor shop. I realized that if I continued to work for the underground and return to a shop, leaving only a few hours later, it was a matter of time before I would become a prime suspect for questioning and arrest. So when I decided to dedicate all of my time to the underground, I became a street kid. My Jewish friends and I begged for food. We slept in the rubble of destroyed buildings. The good caretaker of a morgue in the University of Budapest allowed us to sleep on up on the empty cadaver tables, sheltered from the weather and soldiers constantly patrolling the streets. We hoped that he could be trusted when we bribed him with a little bit of money or some food. We hoped we were safe. 
Who would imagine that there would be children sleeping among the dead? I lived like this <clears throat> for several months. As a boy, I was small, very skinny, very quick. By this time, I was used to street living, so I was a good candidate for the delivery of the shoes bus. The underground obtained a detailed map of the West Budapest sewer system. This map allowed us to use the sewer system to deliver the shoots pass to those people who were waiting in the safe houses. Each time I left the underground print shop, I strapped the documents to my body underneath my clothes and carefully navigated the sewer system. My aim was to surface in the center of the safe house, safe house courtyard, where there was usually a sewer opening. It would be very dangerous for me to resurface on the streets where I would be seen by the soldiers who were constantly patrolling in search of Jews. I delivered the documents to their overjoyed receiver and took pictures. I would then return to the print shop to create more shows past. They were only worthless pieces of paper with an image and a stamp with blue and green colors Yet these were licenses to, to live. The shoving and pushing of the Jews each time I arrived in a safe house confirmed the crushing urgency, panic, and desperation of these poor people. Sometimes I would arrive only with a camera, take pictures for Schutzpass. Time was limited, and if I took just 20 pictures, there were 200 more people pleading with me to bring more. I never said no. I would say, well, I'll try. I'll try tomorrow, or I'll see what I can do. I always promised that I would return the next day with more suspense. The possibility of capture was constantly in the back of my mind. Yet fear had to remain in my remote consciousness because those who showed fear were easily caught. I convinced myself of my own invincibility because I was young and quick and daring. Time and my vulnerability, vulnerability caught up with me. One day as I was delivering the shoots bus, I miscalculated my route. Instead of emerging in the middle of the courtyard of one of those safe houses, I find myself emerging on the entrance gate, uh, uh, outside of the entrance gate, face to face with two soldiers with their guns pointed at me. The soldiers grabbed me and set their rifles against the wall to search me. They found the shoes bus strapped to my body. They laughed and joked, arguing over which one of them would have the pleasure of killing me. I knew that if I did not quick, I would be dead in a matter of moments. While the soldier, soldiers were inspecting the passes, I kicked the guns away from the wall as hard as I could. I ran and zigzagged through the streets, trying to confuse and tire the soldiers. The soldiers were always right behind me. I prayed they would tire and give up the chase. I was scared near death. But I hope that just as I have escaped so many near captures before, I felt sure I would survive this one and they would not catch me. I could hear them fire gunshots at me and they continued to chase. I felt the bullets rush past my head. One bullet actually came so close that it clipped my right ear. I ran. I came upon a place where over a hundred men, women, and children were being marched by Hungarian soldiers with guns and attack dogs. These were the Jews who had been rounded up of their homes and were being taken to the railroad station to be loaded on cattle cars and deported. Quickly I realized that this could be my escape. For anything was better than being shot, I decided to hide among the helpless group, and so the soldiers chasing me lost me in the crowd. But now I faced a new peril. 
The Jews and I were first approaching the railroad station and a train of cattle cars waiting for us. But I thought I escaped before. I escaped one more time. I tried to make my move. Truckloads of SS and their attack dogs now arrived and surrounded us. They shoved us hundreds or so people into each cattle car, slamming the doors shut and crushing us against the other. Escape was impossible. For ghastly five days, we endured the horrors of the cattle car. There was no food, no water for us, two buckets to relieve ourselves. The stench was unbearable. As the days progressed, the conditions became horrendous. Some people took their own lives and became as they became more wretched. One woman was screaming as she gave birth to her baby. The baby cried all night because the mother had neither milk nor water to give. In the morning, the mother mercifully silenced the child. People died in agony from hunger, thirst, suffocation, and exhaustion during those horrible five days. Yet I was young, I thought. I could escape even this. There were a few other boys crowded in the same area as me below a small rectangular window of the car. If you look at a cattle car, then you'll notice that on one of the corners there's about a 12 inch wide rectangular window. That is the window I'm referring to. We thought we would be, uh, that would be our avenue to escape. We hoisted one boy through the window, but as we pushed him through, we realized too late that we were passing over a gorge, and we had pushed the boy to his death. We tried one more time to escape. This time, as we lifted another boy up to the window, we got him halfway through, and we heard a gunshot from one of the guards. One of the guards that was riding on the train the bullet struck the boy's head and his blood and brain splattered all over us. We pushed the rest of his body out of the window. Discouraged, I decided to concentrate on living and didn't try to escape again. Through the changing landscape, some of the older prisoners knew that a train was headed towards Buchenwald. When the train finally stopped, guards with attack dogs opened the cars and pushed us out with their rifle butts. Through a scene of chaos and sorrow, they separated the men from women and children. They forced the men to line up and strip naked for disinfecting. They dunked each one of us into a tub of powerful solution in order to kill the lies that was now covering our body. The solution was so powerful, it also killed some of the weaker prisoners. I witnessed some people going into the tub and drowned as the guards just stood by and left. As a follow-up to the miserable dip, the guards sprayed us from head to toe with DDT. Our clothes were taken from us, and we were given blue and white cotton prisoner clothing. Then we were escorted to barracks where we slept on the floor without blankets. A few days after my arrival, prisoners were asked if anyone had experience working on the railroad. The other prisoners understood that the only way to survive was to work and keep working. I quickly volunteered knowing that if I did not, I would soon be dead. Once again, we boarded the train, only now we, we were delivered to the front lines to repair the railroad tracks. We were immediately rushed to repair the damage wherever a track was bombed. The tracks were always bombed behind the battle front. However, the American reconnaissance planes would fly overhead soon to check out whether the bombing was successful. When they saw people fixing the same railroad that they have just destroyed, a machine gun, thinking that this may be German soldiers. 
We began this work with a group of 500 prisoners, and after three months, most of us were dead, or most of the group were dead, with only a few dozen of us surviving. Since then, there were not enough men to continue the repair work, we were now unable to repair the tracks, and we were useless. However, the guards didn't murder the remaining prisoners, as was the usual custom. Surprisingly, they marched few survivors of Dachau to reinforce us with new prisoners. However, once we arrived in the concentration camp, we were not sent back to repair Bombero tracks. Instead, we endured the remaining months of the war in Dachau. In Dachau, I was given a new job, to go through every morning to the barracks and pick up the bodies, all of those who had died during the night. Another prisoner and I would pile the corpses on a pushcart like so many logs of wood to deliver them to the crematorium to be burned. Hunger was so rampant that we would do anything, anything for food. The bunks have been divided into compartments where four of us slept on a bare wood with one single blanket. We would hold each other close for warmth. One night I awoke because I was freezing cold and started shaking the man I was holding on to. He was cold, realizing that he's cold since he's dead. He had died during the night. Instead of turning over to the body collectors, we shoved him underneath our bunks. That way the Germans would throw us one extra slice of bread that the three of us would divide. I am certain that many of you have heard some horrendous tales about Nazi concentration camp witnessed by others. These atrocities could only be endured because we all had the belief that the Allies would soon come and free us from our nightmares. The Allies finally arrived. I can say with great relief that on April 29, 1945, American soldiers came and liberated Dachau. Yet the prisoners still would painfully suffer and die even after liberation. Many people died after agonizing convulsions they endured after eating their first full meal, which their bodies could not absorb. Filth was everywhere, and the Allies quickly set up showers for survivors, but we were still covered with lies. Many, many in the camp came down with typhus. I was one of them. Three days after liberation, I collapsed from high fever and fell in a coma. I was taken in the, into the field hospital that had been set up on the grounds of the camp by the American soldiers. I awakened at a moment, at, I awakened for a moment and saw that I was in a white room, was wrapped in total silence. I thought, this, this may be heaven. This is where people go after their death. And I made a slight movement. I heard a voice calling, Doctor, come as now. Which means, Doctor, come quickly. Then I faded away again. Doctor came quickly, and I passed out again. When I opened my, I opened my eyes, I saw something like a ball of fire. My eyes were blurry, but as my vision cleared, I saw that a ball of fire was a carnation by my bed. The next words I heard was a nurse saying, Happy birthday. It was my June 4th, and it was my 17th birthday. I had lain in a coma from May 5 to June 4, one full month. This is when the nurse explained to me what I saw when I first opened my eyes. It was a room with camp prisoners who would never enjoy their freedom. They were the most hopeless patients from the camps, those who did not have a chance to survive. They were dying. They were so sick. 
and so far gone that they would be placed in that room on a table and simply covered with a bed sheet to lie until the heart stopped. We have to understand that at that time medication was not available, it was just after the war and while the Americans tried their best, there's just so much they were able to do. I was in that room when I awoke for a moment and moved slightly. And I, um, this is what happened. When I realized it and wondered whether this is like it's in heaven, I moved for some reason. And then when I was awoken, I was explained by the nurse that in that room were mostly people that were just about dead. I was placed there because I was hopeless. There wouldn't be, there's no chance. But for some reason she called in the doctor who decided to bring me back into the field hospital. And I recovered enough by June 4th to have my birthday, my 17th birthday. I have countless stories of, of the horrors I witnessed and experienced while in these camps. But I would now like to turn away from stories about the camps and share with you my life after the war. When I arrived home in my little village in Sasawa, I saw that anything has, everything has changed for the worst. Most of the Jewish families were gone. My parents had been deported to the camps and didn't survive the war. Our house was, and, and our vineyard and our store had been confiscated by the local villagers. They treated the returning Jews with anger and suspicion. I realized that I couldn't stay there and try to regain my old life. I would be forever haunted by my memories. I embarked on a journey to America. In 1947, I arrived in New York. I was penniless and had no profession. The good tailor in Budapest who had taken me in had taught me a few skills. So I began working as a tailor's assistant. As soon as I could, I traveled to Southern California where I had an uncle. I went to school to learn English and there I met another Holocaust survivor, a young woman named Rose, who became my wife and the mother of my three children. I entered the garment industry and began a business that, thank God, grew in time. Years later, Rose became extremely, extremely ill with a rare blood disease. The doctors attributed her illness to the damage that was inflicted upon her while in Auschwitz, where she suffered, where she suffered through sadistic and twisted experiments the Nazi physicians would carry on Jewish children. Nazis had finally killed her at the age of 49. I only died 10 years after the death of my life, of my wife. <laughs> So, so her sad, through her sad death, I realized that the horrors of the Holocaust would never escape me, no matter how I buried the memories of a teenage boy who has, who has survived the Nazis. I, became, I, became, okay, I began reflecting on extraordinary young man that I had been. Oop, that's a nice compliment for myself. <laughs> A teenager with full of steel who survived against all odds. <laughs> Did I survive because of good luck, my shrewdness, my agility? Was there another deeper reason? What could I contribute to the world and to those who died? Why did I survive while so many people around me perished? The answer came to me through my young granddaughter, Heidi who is, by the way, here, Heidi, 11 years old. Heidi was 10, and her fifth grade class was in a program where children could learn about the Holocaust. 
she asked me to speak to her class. A fire was lit, was lit inside me. I spoke about my life during the war to that class. Soon thereafter, I received a stack of thank you letters from the children telling me about the deep impression I had made upon them. I found that by contributing to teaching of the lessons of the Holocaust and retelling the horrors of the past to new generations, I could find some meaning in the appalling events that befell me and millions of others. It is important that I share my experiences with children and explain to them that unless we practice tolerance in our daily life, we will not survive as society. I believe this to be a great tribute to the millions who perished and those who continue to suffer hatred because of their religion, their ethnic origin, their culture, or because of the color of their skin. Wallenberg stood up to one of history's most fearsome, ruthless, soulless regime. Among the people he bugged was one of the most wild, vicious men who ever lived, Adolf Eichmann, who had monstrous power to remove all traces of culture, of an ethnic origin, of a way of life, and of a religion he did not agree with through the use of chaos, carnage, and murder. Each one of us must do our share of improving this society one day at a time. From Raoul Wormberg's example, we realize we all indeed have the capacity to defeat evil in our own way. In closing, I share with you the beautiful words of tribute to Raoul Wormberg, spoken by my friend Annette Lantos, the wife of Congressman Lantos, who is the only Holocaust survivor to, save, to serve as a member of the United States Congress. Raoul Wallenberg did not go to Budapest in 1944 to save Lutheran Swedes. He went there to save Hungarian Jews, with whom he had nothing in common except his humanity. He taught us by example that the only concern for each other that deserved respect is a concern that transcends race, color, or national origin. Raoul Wallenberg not only fought evil, but he also fought indifference. Indifference is the twin of evil. Those who kill are murderers, but those who stand by and do nothing in the face of murder share the complicity of the crime. Raoul Wormberg taught us the single most important lesson of human history is that in order to survive, in order to create more liable conditions in livable, sorry, to create more livable conditions in this world, we must accept the responsibility of becoming our brothers and sisters keepers. The Nazis robbed me of my youth, of my parents, of my innocence. Too early on, I suffered too much. Also, I survived the scars have yet not entirely healed. However, I shall not do unto others what has been done unto me. Rather, I utilize my painful memories, my hardship to battle the hatred and indifference still found in this world. We are our brothers, sisters, and keepers. We cannot stand quietly by as violence and terror continues to ravage the world. I may be one person, but I know in my heart that all of our actions to learn, to know, and to act on behalf of humanity are worthwhile. When I speak to a classroom of hopeful, impressionable children, I implore them to understand the power of one and to emulate the legacy of a man such as Raoul Wallenberg and his self-sacrifice for the sake of humanity. Thank you.
Thank you, Bill, for uh, sharing with us your remarkable story this evening. And we do have time for some questions and answers. If you'd like to pose a question to Bill, he's be happy to answer. I don't think we have an, uh, a microphone in the audience over, so you'll have to speak up. God bless you. You have no idea what we felt when we saw you coming through the fences with your machine guns. It was giving us life again. Thank you for being there. Originally, two, three brothers and two sisters. My oldest brother was lost. My youngest sister was lost. And those of us three in the center survived. Also, my parents. Out of seven, there are three of us that survived. She asked if he is... <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> I, I will repeat, I will repeat. She, she, I, the question is, has uh, Mr. Bash ever returned to Hungary or to his village since uh, coming to this country at the end of the war? To my village I returned once. There were six of us, myself, my spouse, my brother, his spouse and my sister and her spouse. As we arrived in the village, most of the people were farmers, peasants, you know, many of them illiterate and so forth. However, because they took everything from us, we had enormous amount of land and those people that worked our land were crop sharing. Well, when we were taken to the camps, they just took it over as if it were theirs. Now, as we came home, we immediately heard remarks, oh my God, the bashes are alive. What are we gonna do now? <laughs> that was the reception, so. The answer is almost obvious. I left us shortly, however, I did visit Budapest many times, or several times thereafter, but not my village. Once and never again. How do you explain the fact that the Nazis paying any attention to the past? Surely they realized there were some twenty thousand Swedish citizens living in the past. They didn't care about reality. How do you account for this? Remember that Raoul Wormburg worked with the hierarchy, with the generals, with the commandants. He bribed them, he became their friend. And because he was bribing the upper echelon, it filtered down to the average soldier. If you see Raoul's pass, Schutz pass, leave him go. It was not the soldier that was so good, but you know the Germans, how orders were orders. Therefore, through his wisdom, he was able to
to do and, and, and to create a situation where German soldiers were eventually completely confused. They heard it from one general or from one captain, or let it be. So we were very lucky. Some of the time they did not accept Schuss Pass. But that's how he worked it. He was, he was a marvelous, brilliant strategist. I'm referring to Raoul Womberg. The gentleman asked me that I should tell the audience that my visit back home was made into a film. It's not directly so, however, there is some truth to that also. Uh, I am, I, I, I spent time with an organization called Shoah. Shoah is an organization that Steven Spielberg established with a $5 million fund after he made his first successful movie, Schindler's List. The purpose for Shoah was to interview as many Holocaust survivors as possible throughout the world. Finally, they interviewed as many as 52,000 Holocaust survivors in about 40 languages. And then, they decided to turn around and to produce some material which could be used for teaching. So there was one Hungarian person who lost his family in Budapest and he became the last days, the last days I'm referring to from April to December when Eichmann was running the show. He pledged two million dollars with one provision that the film, to make a film, but the film will be made about the last days in Budapest. How did Jews survive in Budapest? So after Spielberg going through many of these interviews has found five individuals who lived in Budapest or in Hungary and met his criteria. Therefore, a film was made first as a documentary or a TV film, but it became much stronger. It is true that we went back to our homes and quite often we had to have security people all around us because they didn't know what in the world are we doing there. Uh, there was chaos in the Carpathian area. It, it was very, very dangerous. However, if there were 10 crew members, we had 40 guards because our life was in danger. But we did finish the film eventually. The film is called The Last Days. And in 1999, it won an Academy Award for the best, not the best movie, but the best um, documentary feature. Now it's a feature and the is October Films has taken on the distribution, which is the key to success in most movies. They are distributing it all over the world, and it's around everywhere. It's worth watching. It's, it's the only, as Spiel, Spielberg has, uh, always tells me, he says, Bill, this movie is so close to me, not because it is the best movie I ever made, but it's the only movie I ever made with the souls that have lived it. There's absolutely no, no script. We just spoke. And in addition to that, Spielberg was very bright. Whenever we made a statement in that movie that this and this has happened, now that could be questionable. Am I telling the truth? So he found in the archives, black and white film, that the Germans had. And that substantiated our move. For example, they, uh, when I mentioned what my job was in Dachau, that I had to pick up the dead bodies and push them to the crematorium, how do you know it is true? 
he found black and white film. It wasn't me, it was other two people, but that's what they were doing, picking up the bodies every morning and sending them to the crematorium. So that is why the film is so good. How, how, the question is, how do you approach such a large and scary uh, topic with a classroom of sixth graders, and how do you teach them? Sixth graders, I, when, I, when I go to speak to sixth graders, I always ask the teacher to prepare them, either by reading a book, telling a story, anything, just as long as they know what Holocaust means. Not stories about Holocaust, but basically what Holocaust means. Then when I approach them, I start asking them questions. What do they know? How much do they know? I feel out how much I can tell them. And if there's anything that kids love, it's horror stories. <laughs> well, all I have to do is tell stories. And you'll be amazed that kids love it. They love everything. Tell us more. Tell us more. However, I don't stop with that. I always finished my conversation, time allowing, with the kids explaining them. The one word, the power of one word, tolerance. I give them examples what tolerance means and also what intolerance means. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm honored to chair one of the university's most dynamic and dedicated group of individuals, the Wallenberg Committee, which has provided the energy and the imagination to make this event what it should and needs to be. And one way to learn about Raoul Wallenberg's courage and his Michigan experience, and to learn about other Wallenberg Medal recipients, is to read the book Remembering Raoul Wallenberg, which is available for purchase this evening in the lobby. Uh, and this moving volume is indeed recalls the best of what this university aspires to be and allows the courage of one person to speak to each of us. Uh, thank you very much, Bill, and thanks to your family for coming to, with you to Michigan. We're honored to have each of you here. And now please, uh, we will invite you to join us in the lobby for a reception in honor of Mr. Bosch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful audience.